Welcome to the Absite Smackdown Podcast. We'll talk clinical scenarios, Absite facts, and interesting general surgery knowledge. Now, let's get to it. Hi, and welcome to the Absite Smackdown Podcast. And today, the team's decided to share with you one of the complete review talks uh, from the video lecture series for the Absite Smackdown review course. Today's talk is all about parathyroid. And from time to time, the team will do this uh, with you all as a community service to share the content and to sort of help you all out uh, as you work through the content for this year's Absite and beyond. So we hope you enjoy it. And remember uh, several upcoming things. First, the Absite Live Smackdown Conference. Absite Smackdown is going live uh, from you all requesting. We're hosting an online review course, uh, which will be held uh, starting January 8th. For more information, look online on the AbsiteSmackdown.com website. Go ahead and sign up for it and reserve your seat. And it'll follow the content in the Absite review book, have speakers from all across the country and Absite experts to share their information with you. So with that, let's get to this next talk all about the parathyroids. And as we say in the course, let's get to it. The Absite Smackdown Podcast. Visit the Smackdown at AbsiteSmackdown.com. Hi, and welcome back to the course. And today, we're going to talk all about the parathyroid. It's important to know that the parathyroid has a unique embryology. The superior glands are from the fourth brachial pouch. The blood supply to those is from the inferior thyroid artery. The inferior glands and the thymus are from the third brachial pouch. And the blood supply is again from the inferior thyroid artery. 90% of patients have all four parathyroid glands. Some don't. The superior glands are usually located posterior laterally to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The most common ectopic gland location, because these have a long way to go, especially the superior glands from the fourth brachial pouch. Embryologically, they have a long way to go, so they often don't end up placed where you'd normally expect. When I say often, most are in the typical location, but there is a distribution of other places where you can find them. And so the most common ectopic gland location is actually in the thymus, where they haven't migrated all the way to where they need to be. They may stop in the thymus. And so when you look for these during a four gland exploration or otherwise, and you can't find all four glands, the most common mislocation is in fact a normal, a gland in a normal anatomic location, but you're just not able to find it for one reason or another. It's uh, very interesting because sometimes people will uh, go about their dissection and not be able to find the gland. And again, when that does happen, <clears throat> The most common mislocation is actually in the normal anatomic position. Just couldn't see it for some reason or couldn't find it. Here are the classic ectopic gland locations, and these come up all the time. If the superior glands are absent in a four gland dissection, look in the tracheoesophageal groove, the tracheal bifurcation, the retroesophageal space, the retropharyngeal space, and the carotid sheath. They can be in any of those places, the superior glands. If the inferior glands are missing, look in the tail of the thymus, again, the most common location for a missing gland. Intrathyroidal position, so it can be inside the thyroid, difficult to appreciate, may need the ultrasound, and in the anterior mediastinum. And then screen right, we have the derivation of the parathyroid glands and the thymus and where it comes from. It turns out that the parathyroids are composed of chief and oxyphil cells. Chief cells are the ones that secrete PTH. Oxyphil cells don't really have a clear function, but they do uh, perform uptake of technetium-99 in nuclear medicine scans. So like we said, the chief cells make PTH. Oxyphil cells, we're not so sure, but it does seem like they uptake tech-99 for those scans. Now, we're gonna talk for a minute about parathyroid and calcium homeostasis. Parathyroid hormone causes bone resorption, and it activates osteoclasts. You end up with an increased serum calcium and phosphorus from this effect. 
It also causes increased renal calcium resorption at the distal convoluted tubule and increased serum calcium and decreased serum phosphorus. And it's more profound than the osteoclast effect. This effect kind of rules. Then you also have increased 1-hydroxylation of vitamin D that already had the 25-hydroxylation in place. And this happens at the kidney. It increases intestinal calcium and phosphorus absorption in the gut. And so you can see screen upper right, low blood calcium levels cause increased PTH, bone breakdown, kidney holds on to more calcium, increased vitamin D hydroxylation, the intestine absorbs more calcium, calcium levels in the blood go up. The Absite Smackdown podcast is based on the best-selling review book, Absite Smackdown. The only Absite review with an entire video review course included. Visit AbsiteSmackdown.com and pick it up today. Now, increased calcium causes a decreased PTH release. This is a feedback inhibition loop. And interestingly, serum magnesium needs to be corrected before repleting calcium. And the reason why is magnesium affects calcium regulation and low magnesium inhibits PTH. Uh, it's actually very interesting and it comes up all the time. Shavastic sign and Trousseau sign, uh, Trousseau sign um, don't just come up with hypocalcemia, although that's how we talk about it. These are seen in hypocalcemia. Uh, Trousseau sign and a tetany these things can all be seen with low magnesium. So it's not just low calcium, but low magnesium that can give Schwastik's and Trousseau's sign. We'll talk about inflating the blood pressure cuff and you get this carpal pedal spasm, that's Trousseau's sign. Uh, Schwastik sign, tapping over the facial nerve, seeing twitch in the area. Calcitonin from C cells of the thyroid from the ultima brachial body, that antagonizes the PTH effects. And you may remember calcitonin puts the bone in. It antagonizes PTH. Here are bony resorption. These are uh, sometimes called brown cysts, but this is subperiosteal bone resorption seen with hyperparathyroidism. Remember, quote, moans, abdominal pain, stones, kidney stones, groans, bone pain, and psychiatric overtones are the signs of hypercalcemia associated with hyperparathyroidism. Brown tumors are osteoclasts. Uh, you don't remove brown tumors. They're high osteoclast resorption areas. And osteitis, fibrosis cystica are all seen uh, in, in issues with issues of uh, hyperparathyroidism. You may see with hypercalcemia of hyperparathyroidism certain EKG changes. This T wave, this peak QRS, uh, peak T waves um, will happen, peak T waves. Hypercalcemia. Uh, hypercalcemic crisis is treated with forced diuresis. So you'll saline load the patient first and then give Lasix. You may also see a very short QT or almost no QT and absent ST segment, absent ST segment, P Q R S T, no ST segment. Um, cortisone and mithromycin may be used. Uh, and you may see the Osborne wave in hypothermia the Osborne wave is this extra wave, uh, and you may see that in hypothermia and hypercalcemia. It's seen in that too. But basically, short QT, absent ST segment, uh, all seen in uh, hypercalcemia. Here's Trousseau's again with the carpal pedal spasm. Most common causes of hypercalcemia, well, 90% are from either hyperparathyroidism or malignancy. Hyperparathyroidism is divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary, and we'll get into that. Malignancies can do it, like squamous cell cancer of the lung secreting parathyroid-related peptide, which looks or acts a lot like parathyroid peptide. It's a paraneoplastic syndrome. And you can get lytic bone lesions secondary to multiple myeloma. 10% is from other causes. Familial hypercalcemic hypocalciuria, granulomatous diseases like sarcoid and TB, Milk alkali syndrome, where there's too much milk, and calcium supplements ingested together. Uh, pseudo uh, hyperparathyroidism, and that's where there's a defective PTH receptor in the kidney. You can get it from excess vitamin D. Uh, thiazide diuretics and even immobilization can all give you hypercalcemia. Again, these are not the bulk of cases. The bulk of cases are either hyperparathyroidism or malignancy. 
Get more AppSite content in your daily routine. Visit us on Instagram at daily.appsite.fact, on Facebook at AppSite Smackdown, or LinkedIn at AppSite Smackdown. And you can catch the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or any place you listen to your favorites. Don't forget our YouTube channel, AppSite Smackdown. There's also parathyroid cancer. Now, this is a rare entity, and here it is, screen left. The calcium levels are typically greater than 14. So if you see greater than 14 calcium level, start to think hyperparathyroid cancer, and it's higher than what's typically seen with hyperparathyroidism. Treatment is a radical parathyroidectomy, and you resect and block any involved structures, including, of course, the parathyroid, but also the thyroid and really anything else involved. Uh, central neck dissection is typically performed as part of the, alongside this. The resection for metastatic disease is palliative, and unfortunately the lesion is not chemoradiation sensitive. It may look benign on histology, so this is a difficult diagnosis. A biopsy may just look benign, and there's a 5 to 75% five-year survival. Now, when it comes to familial hypercalceric hypercalcemia, this does not require parathyroidectomy or surgical treatment of any kind. It's really just doing, owing to a defective PTH receptor in the distal convoluted tubule. You'll see an increased serum calcium and a decreased urine calcium. In hyperparathyroidism, by contrast, you see an increased serum calcium and an increased urine calcium. So familial hypocalceric, its name tells you you'll see a low urine calcium. In hyperparathyroidism, you'll see an increased urine calcium. Again, the types of hyperparathyroidism. Well, we mention them, primary, secondary, tertiary. Screen left shows subperiosteal bone resorption in a classic location in the phalanges, the middle phalanx. Well, in general, 85% uh, of cases of primary hyperparathyroidism, is just they're just from a single adenoma. But foregland hyperplasia and carcinoma can also cause the issue. Uh, you'll see an increased PTH, See an increased serum calcium and increased urine calcium, low serum phosphate. Ultrasound, sesame, B, single photon emission CT, spec, MRI, and even angio with vein sampling can be used to help determine if this is the cause. Primary parathyroidectomy for issues related to hypercalcemia. Uh, so if they have symptoms, primary uh, parathyroidectomy. Or if they're asymptomatic but have a very high calcium, over 13, parathyroidectomy. Or if they have osteoporosis kidney stones, or if they're young because they're going to keep on getting it, they have a long life to live, they get a parathyroidectomy. We talked about moans, stones, groans, and psychiatric overtones, but there are also other subtle findings like frontal balding and hair loss, thinning hair in the area, anxiety, depression, the psychiatric overtones of hyperparathyroidism. Now for adenoma, you resect the adenoma, but for hyperplasia, you remove three and a half glands and auto-transplant that remaining half gland into the forearm, typically, or into the neck in the sternocleidomastoid. Putting it in the forearm is nice because if there's a recurrence or a question postoperatively, you can inflate the blood pressure cuff proximally, and parathyroid hormone, because it has a short half life, will go away very quickly. So, doing an auto transplant to the forearm can be very useful, especially if there's a recurrence or a problem. Uh, you can inflate the blood pressure cuff and rule out the parathyroid peripherally and know that there has to be something left in the neck. That can be very useful. Uh, for um, missing gland, oh, and inflating the blood pressure cuff will increase, will decrease the serum PTH, obviously, and just demonstrate the transplant's working too. Uh, if you're missing a gland, like we said, look for the ectopic locations, and if you still can't find it, uh, you close, follow PTH, and perform a Sestamibi scan or a SPEC CT. Uh, reoperation, uh, if you're at reoperation and you have to go back, remember the most common mislocation is the normal anatomic position. And you evaluate cords before reoperation. Typically, uh, people, like I said, colleagues, when we talk about the thyroid case, they'll put a, a scope down and the laryngoscope will help determine uh, whether the cords are functioning adequately. Post-op, low calcium after a resection of the parathyroid or bone hunger, which is when the bones quickly resorb 
uh, calcium to get back up to speed. That's treated with IV calcium and uh, vitamin D supplementation. Now, secondary hyperparathyroidism, that's due to chronic renal failure, and you often lose calcium with hemodialysis. There'll be an increased PTH. There'll be a normal or even decreased serum calcium and an increased serum phosphate. Total parathyroidectomy with autotransplant, phosphate binders uh, can typically be utilized to treat. Again, total parathyroidectomy here. And remember, calciphylaxis can occur with this, classic skin findings of calciphylaxis. Now, tertiary hyperparathyroidism is unique. That's when there's continuous autonomous PTH release after a renal transplant. You have increased PTH and serum calcium, and there's decreased serum phosphate. Parathyroidectomy is recommended if it continues for one year after a transplant. So you let them go about a year, see if it continues to secrete autonomously and is high. And the treatment here is three and a half glands um, or total uh, hyper, uh, resection of the parathyroids, and again, auto transplant. As we wrap up here, we have a few more things to focus on, and that's MEN1 syndrome, or Wormer syndrome. Uh, Wormer syndrome is due to a meningene mutation on chromosome 11, and unfortunately, it's autosomal dominant, like MEN2. The uh, classic lesions are a prolactinoma, a pituitary tumor, and if uh, a pituitary lesion, parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism, and pancreatic islet cells. Uh, now, Interestingly, um, uh, this is typically a prolactinoma, as we said, and the simul there are sometimes simultaneous tumors in these patients. If there are, you treat the hyperparathyroidism first with a four-gland resection and autotransplant. This is a four-gland disease in this case. Um, there's a neuro if there is a neuroendocrine or a pancreatic tumor associated, the most common is a gastrinoma. And that's in the gastronoma triangle, which you remember from another talk. The gastronoma triangle's ju junction of the cystic duct, uh, where the cystic duct comes in, junction of the second and third portions of the duodenum, and the junction of the neck and body of the pancreas. That forms the uh, gastronoma triangle, where you may find this neuroendocrine tumor in Vermeer syndrome, uh, owing to uh, the fact that you've discovered a patient with hyperparathyroidism and they all, that you investigated the other issues. So fast, the parathyroid lecture is a brief one uh, in comparison to some of our others, but hey, we'll take it when we can get it. Uh, there's a couple more places you can go for additional information, and you've heard them before at the end of the other talk. We'll wind up with them again here. Uh, remember, for more info and to have it come up in front of you in your feeds every day for social media, you can go to Instagram at daily.absite.fact. Uh, Facebook at Absite Smackdown, Twitter at Absite Smackdown, LinkedIn at Absite Smackdown, and on YouTube, you can see the video podcast and certain free review talks at the Absite Smackdown channel. Uh, the Absite Smackdown podcast is located all over iHeartRadio, Amazon, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, um, SoundCloud, uh, almost everywhere you can listen to your favorite podcasts. So, with that, thanks for your time for this one. Uh, parathyroids have some useful, interesting questions, including uh, hy uh, parathyroid cancer that comes up, uh, Vermeer syndrome that uh, comes up, and some of the different interesting facts about hypercalcemia with forced diuresis. Hope you found it useful. And now let's get to the next one. Thanks for listening to the Absite Smackdown podcast. Visit us at absitesmackdown.com for more great Absite facts.